one of the things that's been consistent in, in the cards that I've collected is the fact that um, behavioral health, mental health issues are consistently uh, one of the, the major um, factors that play into a lot of what we've heard this morning. And this is actually open for any of the panelists to, to take this on. What are we doing to address behavioral health, behavioral mental health issues, and what can folks in the audience do to help that work as well? Oh, people are reaching already. This is good. <laughs> I'll lead off and then you guys can um, add in. So um, I'm Jess, uh, uh, Pam and I, um, Pam from BH Care, are co-chairing the behavioral health uh, work group for our CHIP, that community health improvement plan that Patrick spoke about um, earlier this morning. So um, in the last round, we really um, you know, identified behavioral health issues, but in a minor way, and we really focused on substance use and um, underage alcohol, and, and but really the opioids um, crisis. This time around, we said, it's still a problem. We still need to focus on that. But we also need to look at other underlying behavioral health issues that our community is facing. Increased anxiety um, among young children all the way up to older adults. We needed to look at chronic absenteeism and how that plays a role with other behavioral health issues and things going on at home. We needed to look at intentional violence, which is also included in our um, health chapter here. So there's a lot going on, and, and we're honestly still trying to find a way to collect better baseline data about these um, hard-faced behavioral health issues that our community members are facing. Um, but for the ones that we do know, um, you know, anxiety, substance use. We are um, working right now to uh, create and bring evidence-based programs into our community to provide training not only to educators and professional um, colleagues, but also to the parents, to the lay people, uh, the general public, so that we all have some understanding about um, mental health first aid, psychological first aid, um, how we might be able to help people, uh, how we might be able to look for better signs and um, awareness of crisis. And, um, you know, uh, Dr. DeBacco talked about um, the use of the crisis, uh, mobile crisis intervention services. And, um, and Sonia was high. All of our towns were high. I mean, it was something that our CHIP work group um, right off the bat looked at and said, we need to figure out you know, why these families are, are calling and what's going on to it. So there is a lot of work, and behavioral health is sort of this large umbrella of um, different um, topics and, and issues. But we hope to sort of narrow down and to bring more training um, for our professional and, and general <coughs> public, as well as awareness to these, and decrease the stigma, because we know that st stigma is attached to a lot of these, be it substance use or um, anxiety or medication-assisted therapy, things like that. Great. Thank you. Mark, uh, there was a question about the, the well-being index, and, and I'm wondering if you could just give everybody a, just a, a, a brief snapshot of, of who actually took this survey. Uh, the question specifically was what is the level of education from respondents, but I think it goes beyond that to talk a little bit about how these 1,044 um, respondents were selected. Sure. So the the well-being survey is a very large statewide survey. It has about 100 different funders, and they are interested in uh, doing a high-quality survey, reaching um, randomly selected representative adults throughout the state. So the best way to do that is to just make many, many phone calls on cell phones, landlines. It's still the most cost-effective way to get a very large sample. And the most important factor is having a large sample because you need to know that any any adult is you know is represented in the data. So any you know young children, um, people who have multiple jobs, we have to know that the sample is large enough that you have you know every demographic group represented. And then once you have all the responses, uh, the data is weighted similar to any other uh, government survey uh, to um, to ensure that it's representative of the whole population. So uh, this is a methodology that's used widely uh, by like hundreds of government. Uh, you know, surveys that are funded, and uh, we've been able to show that, um, you know, regardless of 
how the data is collected, it's, you basically get the same result every time when the sample is that large and the scientific approach is using to making sure you're getting a random uh, representative sample of everyone. Great. So, Thank you. Yeah. Dr. DeBacco, what should the Valley be most proud of regarding education and where do we go from here? One thing that I, I think we can't um, sell ourselves short on, one thing is we have this very strong uh, manufacturing history. We do. It's something that everyone knows and they, they've built themselves off it. But I just want to also let people know when we have this high graduation rate, we're not handing out diplomas. It's not. What it tells me is that once you hit your sophomore year, I could tell you in Ansonia, I know you're a survivor. If you can go through the things that you've already have, have endured, you're going to make it to your senior year. But one of the greatest things, and I, if you ask me, is if you look across the valley, of those seven communities, we put kids to top tier universities every year. I, someone pointed out on my way in, Bobby Lee said, just so you know, she went to Yale. This one over here went there. And I think those people know who they're talking about. But the thing is, it's great. Top tier universities, but at the same time, what we should be really proud of is the partnerships that every school district has with either local universities or local businesses. And I'm not saying that because I have students that are going to the Allied Health School that Pat Charmel was gracious enough to provide opportunities for our kids that normally wouldn't be able to afford it. I mean, and I have met with people in Shelton and Orange and every person that I've met with, they want our kids. They want to help out. They want to do these things. So if we should be most proud of is that we do have a very caring community. We, we're graduating. I mean, I sat there last week with the Commissioner of Education, sat with a group of Young, young men and women, I couldn't believe how composed, how they comported themselves. They were putting out just wonderful, wonderful students. I'll, tr I'll tell you this, don't believe everything you're reading about the papers about me, don't, read, don't believe what you read about my students as well, because we have some unbelievable kids throughout this valley. And I don't want it to get overshadowed by some other stories that you might read, but between the partners and the businesses, we're, we are on to something, and David, you're right. We can do this. This is not something that we can't do, but it's going to take all of us. But that's what we should be very proud of. Thanks so much. I'm going to ask each one of the panelists to take just a, a, a minute or two in the last few minutes that we have just to, to sum up one practical thing that the audience members can do. If that was one thing that I saw in all the index, uh, sorry, index cards, it was the fact that people were saying, what can I do? What, what can we do to help? What is something that I can take away with other than reading the index and, and you know, talking to other people? What can I do personally? So if each one of you would just take a, a, a just about a, not even a minute, because we're closing in on 10 o'clock, um, but just a few seconds to kind of go through your individual sections, that would be great. Start with Bill. <laughs> <Excellent>. <laughs> <laughs> That'll take up the time. <laughs> it's not on. Here. I'll treat you. There you go. Is uh, the biggest opportunity I think uh, in, in terms of economic potential in our valley is uh, is the Waterbury Branch Line, um, in investing, so lobbying, getting behind. Uh, the fa former Commissioner Redeker was bullish, and he said, we're going to get this done. Um, that can uh, open up uh, tremendous opportunities for our economy, for our residents. Understand the rail goes right through the very heart of our cities. Uh, it can be a catalyst for what's called uh, TOD, transit-oriented develop transit -oriented development. Um, and understand the train goes both ways. People can come into the valley uh, to seek employment opportunities. Uh, so uh, I would advocate, and of course this is tied up now in the larger discussion about tolls and no tolls and um, investing in our transportation infrastructure, but this has been the weak link in the system, and we have a golden opportunity over the next five to ten years uh, to see a substantial investment in, in that line. I think it can change lives. I would say that the 2020 census is coming up in five months, and the state gets about $12 billion every year, so that's like $400 million you know, for the Valley every year. If we don't count, if we miss people in the count, which does happen, especially for babies, very young children, then this, you know, this region and the state's at risk of losing quite a, a large amount of money, as I just noted. So I would focus on uh, what can be done to ensure everyone is counted. 
I always tell people if there's an opportunity to get involved, whether it's um, you know in a professional setting, uh, representing your agency, or volunteering on your own time, um, to do that. Look for opportunity. If you're interested in one of the CHIP priority areas, heart disease, behavioral health, um, whether it be overarching behavioral health issues or substance use, um, or prenatal um, and infant care, um, join one of those work groups. We welcome members of the community. We welcome professional partners. We want people to be at the table to lend your voice to figure this out together. None of us can do this independently, so it's definitely a, a group aspect. Um, look for community events, um, especially if you're, um, you know, in the older adult population or retired and not working and have free time. Most of our agencies have opportunity for volunteers to assist at um, or with our program. So get involved and be at the table and make sure that your voice is heard so that we can be inclusive of everybody. One thing I could say, uh, just so you know about myself, I am the son of immigrants. I've been called son of other things many times, but I'm just <laughs> gonna tell you, by being the son of immigrants, there's, I grew up in a community very similar to Ansonia, four kids. English not being my first language. Three of us went to Boston College. My brother messed up and went to MIT. The, the, the reason why I tell you this is public education is a great equalizer. I've realized, and my parents will tell you, the American dream is here for our students. And all I would ask is you support public education. I know that is the way we can, it, it is a great equalizer. That is getting the best education they can. They can go anywhere they would like to. And I just, all I do is ask for that support, and my mother does like my brother better than me. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. We need, we need a, a wider range of housing choices and an increased uh, menu of options. Um, too many families are struggling. When you look at the data, the data is very clear about the cost burden on so many people from all walks of life, um, whether it's uh, baby boomers that are looking at downsize or millennials who are uh, struggling to navigate education debt, um, hardworking families, there just isn't enough attainable workforce housing for working families in this region, and that data screams in that report. So if there's one thing I could really um, ask you and implore you to do is to attend a housing forum that multiple foundations are hosting um, in Seymour, there's a flyer as, as you go out, the Valley Community Foundation will be handing it out. Um, it's in January, and it's, um, it, it's, gonna ha it's gonna be very interactive. It's gonna have experts that can talk about some of the federal, state, and local resources that are available to systemically address um, this, this significant need, and, and its relevance to each community because the, prescri the prescription is very different based on each of these seven communities in this index. You know, some communities will focus on how to increase home ownership and reduce blight and how to address landlord absenteeism. Other communities will look at, you know, how to support and ensure that seniors who want to remain within their communities can remain within their communities. Um, but housing, the common denominator, I can tell you right now, people ask me all the time, you know, people come to you for food, heating assistance, childcare. I'm telling you, once we sit with that household, at the end of the day, the common denominator is they are expending way too many resources towards the roof over their head, and it's not a low-income issue, folks. It's everybody's problem. Everybody cares about it. Um, and in addition to that, there'll be private developers, there'll be expert panelists from other communities right here in Connecticut who are seven, eight years. It's a marathon, it's not a sprint when we talk about the complexity of housing, attainable housing. Um, but other communities that have really are seven, eight years ahead, I think of Old Saybrook and some others, they're gonna come and share with you about some of the lessons learned so we don't have to reinvent the wheel as well. And then our real um, aspiration is from that housing forum in January, it'll be held in Seymour, um, is to have local s circles specific to those communities and neighborhoods because again the prescription is different and no one knows better the solutions than that town's elected officials, that town's residents, that town's influencers. So please go, go to that in January. Thank you David. Well first of all I think what we all need to do is sort of read and digest the information that's in this assessment because I think if we're better informed, we could be more effective together. And I think as you read through it, there are pieces of this that will appeal to you. If we're gonna improve the well-being of this community, and I, my primary focus is on health, but now we have this broader definition of health, we need to understand that we're gonna influence that where we live, 
where we work, where we worship, where we play, where we recreate, and we need people who are gonna be catalysts. And there's a reason why you're in this room, folks. You're an influencer in this community, right? Uh, I go to a number of events and I see some of the same people, which tells me you are the people that can make a difference in this community. And you have to use your influence to do that. But first of all, you have to understand what the issues are and what the leverage points are. And I think we're all, as I said earlier, becoming more enlightened on what those leverage points are and how we can work collectively to make meaningful change. So, you know, reach out to the person to the left and the right, grab their hand and say, you know, we can do this, but we have to do it together. Thank you all.